Well, I live in Portland, <laughs> so that helps. Um, and I, you know, I'm lazy, so it's a lot easier uh, if I want to describe something in the book to be able to leave my house and go take a look at it than, you know, spend all day on the internet researching some other place in some other city. Um, so I would probably set my books wherever I lived, but I'm really lucky that Portland makes such a great thriller setting uh, because it's, you know, it's drizzly and dark and um, th there is just a sense of entropy all of the time, um, at least, you know, ten months out of the year. There's a lot of moss and mildew and rot. Um, and I say that as somebody who loves moss and mildew and rot. I love Portland. Um, but uh, uh, there's something about the darkness of the place and um, the landscape that surrounds it that uh, I think really lends itself to um, spookiness. The Van Port flood um, did happen uh, in 1948. Uh, and it's, you know, it was this, Van Port was a town that at its height was 40,000 people. and. Um, when the flood happened, it was 15 to 20,000, and it was basically a company town of, of ship workers. And uh, but it was it was a full town. I mean, there were um, uh, you know lots of housing structures and a theater and you know everything you would need. And it was wiped out completely by a flood. I mean, there was not a structure left of this town. You know, of 20,000 people. And I lived in Portland for like 10 years before I'd ever heard about it. And it was it was um, just north of Portland. And I was really fascinated by um, the fact that this event had been so lost to Portland history. Um, and it was right about the time uh, that Katrina was happening. And there were so many echoes of Katrina, Van Port. Um, there were a lot of, uh, it just, there was a lot of racial diversity in Van Port. Um, and a lot of people, there were a lot of conspiracy theories at the time that it, uh, people believed that it had been allowed to flood, or at least had not been protected as much as it could have been because um, the city was more worried about protecting downtown. Um, and, I, you know, I thought this story was just so rich the more I learned about it, um, the more I found um, just these specific stories of tragedy and heroism. Um, and the mystery that surrounded that, because they never really knew exactly how many people died, and they never really knew exactly, um, you know, why the flood had been allowed to happen. Um, there, were, there was just a lot of conflicting stories historically, and I thought it would just make a great, um, a great backstory for the book. Uh, for Vanport, there's an or with the Oregon Historical Society had a lot of information. Um, you know, I found a lot online. I don't know what authors did before the internet. I can't imagine, like, you would have to leave these blanks and go to the library and <laughs> redo your research and come back. And now I can just find stuff on Google and I can find, um, you know, photographs and I can find eyewitness testimony and all these old newspaper stories. I mean, it's just this wealth of information. In fact, I have to be careful to limit my research because otherwise, you know, I'll find it and just sort of follow it um, for days and days and neglect actually writing the book. Um, but that's a big part of the fun for me. And one of the reasons I wanted to write about Vampor and make it um, you know, part of the backstory of the book was that uh, it allowed me an excuse you know, to, to delve into it and to learn all these stories that I you know, had lived in Portland for so long without hearing. Um, we have the same clothes, a lot of the same clothes. And, um, we definitely have some, you know, family history in common. Um, she's a lot, uh, I think I'm a much more stable, <laughs> mature version of Susan. I like to think that about myself, but um, we have a lot in common. And in fact, you know, it's funny, I think because of that, she's the hardest character for me to write. I think we're a little too close because, um, um, I, you know, I. I end up writing those scenes, and it's also a struggle for me to make her likable, which is ironic, since she does sort of stand in for me. Um, I'll find that, you know, that's a reaction I get from people. They're, you know, they're like, Susan, you know, I love your books, but Susan, like, what is up with her? What is her problem? I'm like, that's me. <laughs> I hope so. That's the goal. Um, the characters have to change and evolve, and the trick is, to evolve characters without losing the essential elements that readers like. I mean, you know, that readers like characters for certain reasons, and you don't want to change those reasons. But if you don't change the characters, then they become really stagnant.
that's not interesting. And that, I think, is when you lose energy in a series. So that's a constant struggle. I miss, I miss Gretchen. She's my favorite character, um, which probably speaks to, <laughs> to the dark recesses of my brain. But she's very fun to write because she's charismatic and witty and unpredictable um, and very wicked. And so I missed her presence. And you know, she, her presence is there because she has affected Archie so much. Um, uh, but you know, she, she uh, only has a couple of physical scenes in the book. Um, but I, I did, I missed her a lot. She'll be back. Um, well, thrillers and mysteries. And I'm not just saying that. Those are the only audiobooks I listen to. Um, I, I, because they're so compelling, you know, and I actually, um, when I was in college, I lived um, in Bellingham and uh, went to college at UC Irvine, which was um, like an 18-hour drive, um, and I would get on the highway and just drive straight down I-5, and I would listen to Sue Grafton audiobooks, and um, there was once when uh, uh, I um, actually ran out of gas because I didn't want to stop to get gas, because I didn't want to stop listening to the book. <laughs> Even though obviously it would pause while I got the gas, I couldn't stop. And I, I literally ran out of gas and had to walk <laughs> along the highway a quarter mile and get a little canister and come back. So I told Sue Grafton that story <laughs> not that long ago. <laughs> and she thought it was a great compliment, and it was.